Restaurants, you know, as much as some people maybe think they're a passion project or something like a creative outlet, at the end of the day, for us, this is our business. It is our livelihood. You know, as much as it is um, something that we love to do, we do need to make it um, financially viable for us um, and for our teams too. Hello, everybody out there in listener land. This is Danny Valant with you for another episode of Dirty Linen. Uh, Thank you so much for listening today. I am really looking Looking forward to this chat. As you'll know, we've been talking a lot about the state of hospitality. And uh, one thing that is so clear is that restaurants are watching what other restaurants are doing. Uh, Everybody is interested in seeing how other businesses, perhaps businesses that they feel a sort of kinship with, are navigating these really tricky times. And it was actually another restaurateur in Victoria that um, pointed me to what restaurant Labatt on the Gold Coast has recently done, which is reshaped their business offering to account for the changing times in society. Um, so our guest today is Carla Munoz Labatt. She is one of the owners of restaurant Labatt in Burley Heads. Carla, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thanks, Danny. So good to have you on the show. Um, I haven't been to your restaurant. I've looked at photos and just looked at the menu and it all sounds really good. But explain it from your perspective. So Restaurant Labatt, we, my husband Alex and I opened in 2018. So we will be celebrating our sixth birthday this year. Um, quite a few changes over that time. When we first opened, um, the idea was to be a sort of casual local neighbourhood restaurant, um, somewhere that people could come pretty frequently, pop in for a plate or two and some wine, um, somewhere just really for locals. Um, I guess because of Alex's um, cooking background, coming from Sydney, working in higher end restaurants, people sort of started to pigeonhole us a bit as more fine dining, a bit more of a higher level. Um, and we sort of lent into that um, after a while, which was uh, which worked well. We, over the past few years, have been running as a sort of set menu um set menu only restaurant and that was good for a while but as you mentioned times have sort of changed recently so we've um, made some changes with it. So it's so interesting because restaurants obviously are there to look after customers, but you also have, you know, your own project. You have reasons that you open a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, tell us about some of the conversations you've had with Alex um, about that balance. Yeah, I guess um, that that's exactly right. Restaurants, you know, as much as some people maybe think they're a passion project or something like a creative outlet, at the end of the day, for us, this is our business. It is our livelihood. Um, we've got two small children now as well that has kind of come in the past couple of years. Um, so, you know, as much as it is um, something that we love to do, we do need to make it um, financially viable for us um, and for our teams too. We've got a staff of around 10 um, at Labatt and we've also got a Paloma Wine Bar as well just down the road in Burley and we've got about another 10 there. So there are, you know, 20-odd people that um, their livelihood is also um, impacted by what we do at the venues. Um, I guess in terms of uh, the changes that have that have come about, it, it was a lot of conversation. Um, from, a, from a business perspective, we were in a really good place when we moved to that set menu only format. Um, you know, the spend per head was fantastic. Um, the number of people through the door was fantastic post COVID when people had plenty of money to spend after being um, locked down for a while. Um, but what we sort of started to see was that the numbers were dropping off. So we just weren't getting the same number of covers um, that we were. And it sort of forced us to rethink what we were doing and seriously have some conversations around what changes we needed to make. So, I mean, that's, yes, so interesting. So you feel like you're giving people what they want, but then what they want changes. (laughs) Well, Um, yes, exactly right. So, I mean, did you have conversations with people who perhaps had been regulars but you now hadn't seen for a while like how did you sort of deduce what was going on Mm, yeah that's that's exactly right we um it's a really good point we sort of changed originally because I 
crunched the numbers a little bit and and we worked out that when we had the optional set menu or a la carte, it was something like 85% of people that came through the door were choosing to do the set menu. So we reached a point where it was kind of silly to have this a la carte option when people weren't choosing it. And just from a logistics perspective as well, um, managing waste, managing, you know, staffing and rosters and having our, um, having all of that in place with the set menu only really worked well. And it was, that was clearly what people wanted when they had the choice. Um, But then, like I said, over the last sort of year or so, um, cost of living pressures. We just weren't seeing the same people um, that regularly. People were coming maybe once a year um, and exactly those those locals that were coming at the very beginning that we saw in 2018 and 19 hadn't been back and they still lived locally um, in Burley and on the Gold Coast and when we would run into them in the street it was sort of like, oh, you know, we're not really looking to come and do a long um, formal degustation. Um, so we... we we're still doing that for a little while, um, sort of up until we, we made this change only five weeks ago. So it's pretty fresh. Um, but what we did do was we tested the waters a little bit um, towards the end of the second part of last year. Um, and we did a couple of um, French bistro nights and Italian trattoria nights as well. So we changed the concept for a couple of a couple of Thursdays in a row where we just did a one-off um, bistro labart, we called it. Um, and did a much uh, more bistro style menu, um, really more relaxed kind of vibe, and the response was phenomenal. So, lots of those locals who hadn't come in when it was a bit more formal and set menu were, were suddenly back, and and people were emailing and DMing on Instagram asking when the next one would be. So, we did um, a handful of those, and the response sort of was a good indication to us that that was what people were were after. And the other, I guess, indicator for us is um, because we do have Paloma. Um, Um, the wine bar down the road. That's a much more um, relaxed kind of setting in terms of it's walk-in onlys, no reservations, um, a much lower spend per head, people coming in just for a glass of wine or a cocktail and some snacks. And despite Labatt sort of covers numbers dropping, um, Paloma is pumping and has been the whole time. Um, So I think it's just that, that sort of concept that for, for us anyway, that people think they can kind of come in. There's not as much pressure on them to spend a lot of money. Um, you know, once they're in the door, they may choose to. But, um, yeah, it was interesting to see how Paloma was doing in comparison to Labatt, and that was probably another um, indicator to us that this was um, a good idea to make a change. Yeah, it's so interesting what you say about, you know, people may end up spending that much anyway because I think when you see, when you know, when you book for a set menu experience, you know that you're going to spend at least a certain amount. Um, Do you find that people don't want to make that commitment, but actually once they're through the door that the spend might be similar? Yeah, exactly. And I think um, the other thing that we have changed, um, so we, when we moved to set menu only post-COVID, we also moved to a upfront um, prepayment, so kind of like a ticket. Um, And we've talked about this previously, um, you know, the idea that in so many other industries, especially creative industries as well, you buy tickets to a show, a gig, a concert, a theatre, um, whatever it may be, tickets to a you know a flight, and people happily pay their money up front. But when it comes to restaurants, people just don't want to make that commitment. Um, we felt we needed to do that post COVID because we had less seats. Um, you know, with the 1.5 metres between the tables or whatever it was, um, we had a much reduced sort of capacity and if people were to just no show or cancel at the very last minute, um, that was a real problem for us financially. So we moved to this upfront payment. We found that it just eliminated no shows altogether, um, which was great. And we obviously still had lots of flexibility around if people were sick or had COVID or any reason really that they needed to cancel. Obviously we would refund them or rebook them. Um, but it just sort of made people think a little more before booking. Um, so that was really positive for us, but again, Again, um, that has changed in the past couple of, well, probably 12 plus months where we've seen that as more of a barrier for people who aren't willing to pay up front, maybe don't want to part with their money ahead of time. So we've done a complete um, backflip on that and it's now just a, you know, pretty standard credit card hold like most other restaurants do, um, no money taken. So that's been a big change too. It's just the, the nimbleness and, you know, these sort of constant reframing and, you know, trying to get inside 
customers' heads. Like there's just so much um, flexibility required from you as business owners. I mean, it, how do you sort of reflect on that? Yeah, it's um, it's definitely interesting. I'm not sure about, you know, how many other industries have to do so many sort of changes as, as hospitality as we're trying to keep up with with the changing um, pace, but but we get it too. We understand it, you know, where um, we also love to go out and eat at restaurants and we're also affected by the pressures that are, you know, happening with the economy at the moment. So in the same way that, that we're seeing our customers affected, we also, we understand it. So I guess for us, it's a bit of a no brainer. Um, we had to do a, a massive pivot um, when, when COVID happened, obviously for restaurants, we'd never done takeaway before. Um, so that required a, a big pivot. The food that we serve at Labatt was not the kind of food that would do well to be packaged up and um, taken home. So we had to come up with whole new um, dishes and menus and, um, you know, that's something that we've done before. So I think the fact that we're pivoting again now and making changes, um, it doesn't feel like such a big deal. It just feels necessary. And what about the actual, you know, what's on the plate? You know, is, is Alex doing, are the dishes more simple? Are there fewer garnishes? Like how are you sort of balancing out the flexibility of an a la carte menu with what I'm, I'm sure you got nice and used to having more <laughs> of a, you know, controlled larder, mm. knowing exactly that you could buy what you were going to sell? How, how are you managing that? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, in that sense, things haven't changed too much in terms of you know quality of produce. We're still working with all of the same producers and suppliers. Um, quality of ingredients, none of that has changed. Um, obviously, yes, the a la carte menu um, has kind of brought with it new not challenges, but just yeah, difference to, to having everyone on the one set menu. So it makes, you know, you've got to be a little more strategic. Um, Alex and our um, head chef at Labatt, um, Stefano, who's been with us for just over a year now, joined us from Melbourne. Um, he, he, they've done a great job with the menu and they still, yeah, keep it super simple, let the ingredients speak for themselves. And, and also I think worth noting is we are in Queensland, so we do feel, I mean, there are pressures for staffing across all of Australia in the hospitality industry, but we do feel it um, feel it in Queensland um, because I probably say that the level of um, of hospitality, you know, career hospitality people, chefs, front of house, we don't get um, so many of them through the door coming uh, to the Gold Coast wanting to live here. So we we also have to work with the staff that we have in terms of um, dishes, um, so kitchen and front of house, and I think. Um, our team does a really good job of kind of working with what we have and not trying to achieve something that we we just can't um, here on the Gold Coast. What are you seeing in terms of, you know, trends? What are customers leaning towards? You know, are you really noticing that people are looking for a certain type of meal? Um, I think it's more about this idea that they aren't intimidated to just come through the door. So a lot of people, you know, like I mentioned, labart has been around for nearly six years and there are still a huge number of people on the Gold Coast that say, oh, I've heard of it, but oh, I'm not sure I'll come for, I'll come for a birthday or I'll, I'll come for, you know, at some stage. I'm, I'm, it's sort of like they're intimidated by it or, or we don't go to fancy restaurants. So I think for us, the big thing has been sort of shifting that um, that message that, that Labatt isn't some sort of scary fine dining restaurant. It's somewhere that anyone can come and enjoy themselves. Um, and I think people are looking for, for atmosphere and vibe. Um, and that's something that we've just noticed in the last five weeks with the change of menu. Um, there is definitely more of a, a vibe in the in the space with more people through and, and a buzz and yeah it's been a it's been a great result so far so how would you like okay I meet you on the street I don't know I've heard you know my friend went there but that, and they said it was good but I don't know I don't know if I can eat I don't, I don't know what escabeche is and what's <laughs> what's a gastrique like is that okay is it because that food um like how do you get how do you talk me around tell, tell me what what tell me why I'm gonna love the experience yeah, well, I think you've picked probably yeah two of the uh, um, words on the menu that might people might not be familiar with. <laughs> We're trying to keep <laughs> keep the rest of it pretty um, pretty straightforward and simple, and that in itself is is something um, you know that we've we've had to change. I remember Alex's opening menu um, at Labatt in 2018 um, had tartare on it, and um, P 
people were, were literally, some people didn't know that it was raw. Um, so, you know, it's been, it's been a bit of a learning experience in terms of um, that. But I do think over the past sort of five or six years as well, people from the Gold Coast or, or Queenslanders that, you know, they are well-travelled now. Um, and so it's, it's probably, it was more of a brand perception um, that people had, whether or not they'd pigeonholed Labatas Fine Dining or, like I said, we, we really did lean into that um, format as well with the set with the compulsory set menu. So it's sort of like shaking that off a bit and just letting people know that it's not scary and intimidating and um, they can just come in and, and order a couple of things and make their own choices. Um, and we do have an optional shared set menu now um, and I'm interested to see whether lots of people elect to do that and then we end up with the same kind of... Um, statistic down the track that everyone's choosing it again. But so far, it's mainly people ordering a la carte. So watch this space. Carla, I'd love to learn a bit more about how you come to be there doing what you're doing. Um, what's the backstory to Labart and being there in Burley Heads? Yeah, so I actually grew up on the Gold Coast. Um, I finished high school here and moved straight to Sydney for uni and swore I'd never come back to this little country town um, on the beach. So there was nothing much going on. Um, and then I lived in Sydney for about 14 years and I met Alex during that time. Um, my career background is media and communications um, and I was working in public relations for a number of years. I ended up working, getting into hospitality PR and working for the crew, um, uh, for Janine and uh, the crew there for a number of years and Sally when she was there. And Monopole um, was one of my clients, the Bentley Group, and Alex was the head chef at Monopole in Potts Point. So we met sort of through work and um, ended up getting together and decided we wanted to open a restaurant a few years in. Um, and we did look at some sites in Sydney um, and after looking around a little bit, we sort of realised that if you're opening a restaurant, you're, you're really putting roots down and really, you know, cementing yourself in that area. So we'd gone back to the Gold Coast a bit to visit um, friends and family here. And um, Alex had also randomly lived on the Gold Coast himself and done an um, apprenticeship at a French restaurant here back in the day, separate to knowing me. Um, and we both loved the Gold Coast and the beach and we thought it might be a good idea to move up and settle ourselves here um, with the idea of having kids as well and the lifestyle that that brings. I think also um, the, the work life that Alex had in Sydney was was pretty full on. Um, and we both liked the idea of a little more work-life balance um, and being near the beach. So that's something that we've also really worked hard at with our teams. We run a four-day week um, at Labatt for... Um, all the full-timers um, and that the idea is that they've got those three days um, for their, you know, own sort of outside of work things. Hospitality is pretty full on, as you know. <laughs> so interesting. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the crew does an amazing job of, um, I guess, helping restaurants get their messages out there, like really clarifying their stories. Um, what have you been able to bring from that world into the world of uh, a business owner in hospitality? Yeah, I suppose that's something like a, you know, in terms of team and partnership, Alex is the chef and the creative and then I bring um, maybe everything else. <laughs> no, everything else to do with the uh, the social and the marketing and the PR. And I think brand messaging is so important. So yeah, that everything I've, you know, my background in PR has made that, um, that side of what we do a lot easier. Um, I think that things that I learned there, um, easy to, easy to apply. And, um, probably if anything, my struggle is just keeping that brand messaging, um, correct. And that's probably been my biggest struggle with the changes that we've made. Um, just, you know, repositioning that people understand where we're, where we are now. So yeah, that's my main focus, but yeah, it's invaluable. I think, um, obviously if, if that wasn't something that I had expertise in, we would hire someone like the crew to do that for us. Yeah, that's, um, Really interesting. I mean, what advice do you have for other businesses who are, you're wondering about making a change? Um, what what sort of – how do they find that clarity themselves and then the clarity in delivering that message to customers and potential customers? And I suppose, you know, tracking back to, to the teams before they even, you know, go external. Mm, yeah, good question. I think for us, um, the best thing was listening to our customers. Um, you know, obviously the numbers are one thing. So 
seeing a drop in covers was pretty obvious to us. Um, but then having those conversations with our customers and locals and regulars and, and getting that direct feedback. Um, so that was probably the first thing. And that was what made us realise this is this is it, testing the waters a bit. Like I mentioned with those other um, nights that we did, that was a, a good indicator to us um, that this was something that people wanted. And then I think once you have made that decision, getting your team on board is big. That was a bit of a concern for us. A lot of our team had joined us um, when we were set menu only. So actually almost all of them, none of them had been with us pre-COVID. So the Labatt that they signed up for was um, this set menu format. And Alex and I were a little worried that we might bring this idea to them and people would say, well, no, that's not why I took this job. Um, but actually they were all overwhelmingly positive and excited and they could all see it too, you know, that's like we needed to make a change. So um I think getting your team on board and then the next thing is just working out what that message is um, and getting getting that sort of brand um, awareness out there and in the right way, getting that message told. I mean, one thing I noticed from your socials is that you're quite explicit about what you were doing and why you were doing it. Is that um, openness something that you think is important for doing business these days? Yeah, I think that that's what consumers want. I think that there are, um, look, we didn't have to do it that way. We could have made the change. I think for us, because we have made changes in the past, we felt we owed it to our customers to explain the change. Maybe if it was the first change, the first time you were making a change and it wasn't, you know, a big deal, you might just sort of make that announcement and not explain why and people maybe wouldn't question it too much. But we did feel like um, we needed to explain that to people and and also that that would work in our favour. Um, and if you, yeah, if you have a look on our Labart's Instagram page, you know, the comments and the feedback from that sort of first announcement that we made and then a recent video that we put up of Alex and I talking about it, um, the feedback and, you know, the comments have been so positive and I think people want to hear that and for us because it wasn't a big change in terms of we didn't change our name or our whole branding it's just a message change um that was important that we could um tell that in an explicit way otherwise people would sort of go well it all looks and feels the same what's the difference so yeah do you think that's a cultural shift in hospitality like if you think back to your days in sydney pr i don't know like monopole's doing something different um do you think that there would have been then a bit more of massaging the message um making it all seem seamless and yeah do you think there has been a change like that yeah I think so I don't think we ever talked back in my Sydney PR days about um owners coming out and talking about why changes are being made I think it was just like this is this new exciting thing we're doing and bam it's out in the press media releases pitching and that was it there wasn't probably too much conversation around it um I think there's yeah definitely been a change in in that over the past few years and I don't exactly know what that is um why that's come about but maybe just consumers wanting to be more sort of um you know understanding more why changes are happening yeah I don't know I feel like there's definitely um this idea that brands need to be authentic and of course you know authentic can be in very big quotation marks uh quite often but there's this notion of appearing to be authentic um but I I think also perhaps there was this you know COVID was was so tough and it was impossible to just um not really show how the sausage was being made I think and um but I think you know there's I feel like there's a you know a sort of two stream um sentiment with consumers where some people you know like their minds have been open to the realities or some of the realities running a hospitality business and they have genuine empathy for you know the ups and downs but I feel like for other people they would rather that you know yeah sure okay we're all in it together but now can we just close the door again can you do can you just create the magic for me um and I'll just sit here and have fun yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah, exactly. Do you think that there are, I mean, you, you, uh, what I see from you is that you're really looking hard at all the things that you can control and making changes to respond to it, um, you know, in a way that's aligned with your own values and ambitions. But are there things that are 
outside of your control that you would just love to see change, whether it's, I don't know, the cost of particular things or the way that certain elements of the industry are regulated? Um, yeah, if you could wave a magic wand, what would, what would you like to change mm. for hospitality? Oh, big question. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously per- – costs at the moment are through the roof. I think that's probably been spoken about enough, so I won't go into it too much. But it is it is a real challenge for us that our costs keep rising, um, but we can't keep putting the prices of our menu up, um, you know, and we totally get that. But if we were to do a, re- a more accurate menu pricing structure based on our costs and wages and, you know, all of the, all of the costs that have gone up, things would be a lot more expensive on the menu. But we totally understand that if we do that, um, you know, the, the the general consumers, they've got the same challenges and they can't afford to just keep paying more and more as well. So it is a really difficult situation um, and we just need to sort of do the best we can in that sense. Um, but what else would I change? Um, hmm, I don't want to get into too much, um, anything too political, but... Um, <laughs> You can if you want. (laughs) Maybe a conversation for another day. But, yeah, definitely costs, um, you know, that's the biggest challenge that we are facing for sure. Okay. Um, Well, I've had your menu open on my desktop the whole time we've been talking and it's made me very hungry. So I reckon, I know it's just a sample a la carte, but I think what I would have – I don't know, I'm really loving the sound of this toasted brioche with mushroom custard and parmesan. And then I'm very intrigued by the entree of porchetta, smoked eel tonata and pickled rhubarb. That sounds like it's got all the the fat and the tart and the salty going on. Exactly, exactly. Thinly sliced. Um, it's, yeah, it's that's a real winner. That's been probably one of the uh, standouts for, for customers. Yeah, interesting. And um, the mains sound really interesting, like the, that barbecued quail with the black fig and the hibiscus mysterious gastrique. But <laughs> um, no, I love that, um, I guess, vinegar-based sauce. Uh, and But then, I don't know, it could be hard to go past the steak. Um, you got a few nice-sounding steaks there with various um, classic sauces. Yeah, that's it. Just keeping it simple. You've yeah. got to come with a few friends so you can try everything. Well, you know what I might end up doing, though, Carla? We might just have the sample shared set menu for $85 a person and just bring There you go. Whole- get a taste of everything and then, then you can um, we can talk in another year and I'll tell you that we've gone back to set menu only. <laughs> well, let's do that because I would love to keep up with what you're doing. Um, yeah, really fantastic to chat you've got such a great perspective on the industry and yeah I think this conversation will be really helpful for a lot of people so thank you great thanks so much Danny nice to talk this is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant we air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about hearing from different people with unique perspectives we want to hear from you as well If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.